welcome to my channel. My name is Charity Rissler Watrich, and uh, today we will be in part three of my series of how to share truth with a message believer. Part one is how to prepare for the conversation. Part two is more of the questions you can ask to get started that don't actually go fully into issues with William Branham, but rather, where is your truth? Is your truth found in scripture or is it what Branham said? And sharing scripture with that person to see where they lie on that playing field and to hopefully help them see a little bit of the mental gymnastics that they're doing and the inconsistencies in their own logic that it takes to believe in Branham and say you believe the Bible at the same time. Um, so that's part two, and I highly, highly recommend that you start there. So with that, let's jump into part three. In part three, we'll be talking about particular facts about Branham and why he's a false prophet and why he should not be followed. So we're gonna go um, in like four different sections. So this is gonna be a little bit of a longer video. In the first section, I'm going to be talking about some of his prophecies and the next one, honesty, and the next one, healings, and lastly, doctrine. So I'm, because there are so many different things that there would be to discuss with the message believer, I just wanted to give you a taste of a few different categories that you can talk with them. And I'm gonna give you some resources that you can do more research on your own so you're more equipped and you can have resources to give to that person. So I'll, I'll give you some resources now and a few different points that you could discuss with them. And I hope to do a video later where I just basically list many different resources for people who are doubting the message or coming out of a message. He's called a prophet, so it makes sense that the first category, I think, should be prophecies. So read with uh, the person you're sharing with. Read with them Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know a word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you need not be, be afraid of him. If their standard of truth, if your standard of truth is scripture, then you should be starting from this point and seeing, well, does Branham line up with this definition of what a, a true prophet of God would be? So if we now, this is where uh, in the last section, I would just end it there and say, well, if Branham didn't line up with this, would you stop following him? And in this section, we're actually gonna dive into why he does not. And so um, I, that's why I think it's really important if you haven't watched part two, again, go back there because I think that's a great starting point to see whether the person you're talking to is actually teachable. All right, so I'm going to be sharing a few different resources. I'm gonna do a little bit of screen sharing and hopefully it works. I have never tried this before in a video, so we'll see how it goes. So here we are. I have a few tabs I will show you. Um, um, depending on how you wanna share things, I'm gonna give you a few different options for the Municipal Bridge vision. Um, firstly, I think that this podcast is amazing. Um, so uh, the Off the Shelf podcast is a podcast for uh, people who have left the message. It basically is going through the premises when you're in the message, you're putting a lot of things on the shelf, so you're not thinking about it. And this is saying, okay, now we're taking those things off the shelf, things that you thought were odd before, um, contradictions you've heard maybe in the back of your head that you had put on the shelf, now they're coming off. So I, I love that premise. So in this podcast, Rod and Brian interview the authors of the Searching for Vindication website, which is a website that is also um, dedicated to searching for truth about William Branham. And it's a really interesting story because they actually um, started the site 
with the municipal bridge vision, they were actually trying to refute some of the things that were on um, the Believe the Sign website, where Believe the Sign had given some reasons why the bridge vision did not come to pass, and they actually went and dug into a bunch of records trying to disprove that article. There's part one and two of that, so you get to see a little bit of what actually went into that research. They did extensive research to look into this vision to see how if it actually came to pass and was a true prophecy. And then they ended up publishing their results um, where they found out that it did not come to pass. Clearly, if you're watching my video, that means you're not opposed to watching YouTube videos. So the Municipal Bridge Vision uh, video by Believe the Sign, I think, is also a great resource. I will include all the links to all the things I'm referencing in the description below, but I think that that's a great resource. It's short um, and gets to the nitty gritty real easily. Here is the article from Believe the Sign, which I think is also super um, helpful way. Based on research, so searching for Vindication had done extra research, as I mentioned before, there were only two fatalities in the construction of the bridge, whereas Branham's quote, if you look here, said 16 men fell off that bridge and drowned. So this is something where um, there's no evidence of 16 fatalities. It was only two. And I think that this is a type of prophecy that Branham uh, could have easily made where um, he had a chance of being right. This is a type of prophecy that Branham could have made really um, having the advantage of the fact that building a bridge is super hazardous, especially back in the day. And so maybe there could have been more fatalities and he could have almost been right, but he wasn't right. There was only two fatalities, but he said that he was right. He said that the prophecy came to pass. And so I think that's where it gets a little dangerous and tricky with Branham's prophecies because we get into this idea where we are only looking at what Branham said and not actually looking at the evidence, which you wouldn't do that with something else. If a, if a company is saying that they um, have a five-star rating and you look them up and you see that they have a three-star rating, um, you're going to see that that is inconsistent. But if you just take their word for it, <laughs> well, then you might get bad service. <laughs> and it's kind of, I use that as an analogy because you wouldn't do that with a business. You would actually look them up and not just take their word for it. But with Branham, you just take, I used to just take his word for it. And so I think that's something to point out. Um, the municipal bridge vision did not come to pass. Um, and it's one of those visions that there's not a um, indefinite like future time where maybe it could come to pass. No, this is something that is done. The bridge has been constructed. There's no more chance for Branham to get this prophecy right. And so this is a prophecy, one of many, that did not come to pass the way Branham said. And that was something that was shocking to me. This is one of the first um, things that I saw coming out of the message where I had no idea. And then lastly, for the prophecy section, I only really wanted to get into one or two things on each of these sections just for the sake of time. But if the prophecies are a big point of why they believe Branham is who he says he is, then I think that the other great resource for you to check out is this article from Believe the Sign, which I'll also have linked, of course, um, which has a great comprehensive list of all the different prophecies, as you can see here, many different prophecies that Branham made, and you can see whether they came to pass the way he said they did or not, um, with evidence. And like, as you look into this, you'll be able to see, if you haven't already, and the person with you will be able to see, oh, Branham actually changed a lot of his prophecies as they went along so that it would sound more like as the date was approaching, sound more like it was actually coming to pass, or um, he would cover up the fact that he prophesied something, he'd spitfire a bunch of prophecies, and then you didn't hear about the prophecy again because he did, it didn't come to pass at all. 
So um, those are some things to look out for in his prophecies. So if we go back to this scripture, Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22, you can see that this definition of a false prophet, um, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. And I hope that that's something that is obvious. As you go through here, you will see that Branham spoke a lot of things presumptuously, using the Lord's name, saying, thus saith the Lord, um, to things as a way to put um, authority on it. And then those things didn't happen. So I hope that that section was helpful for you. Um, if you're going to be talking about the prophecies with message believer in your life, the next section I think is appropriate to go through. Speaking on the line of prophecies and those prophecies changing over time, um, I think it's appropriate next to talk about honesty. And so ask the person that you're with, would you trust a leader who blatantly lied? This also ties a little back into part two, talking about the fruit of the spirit of a leader um, and uh, somebody who is a regenerate believer, the way that they should be showing that, that fruit of the spirit. And one of those things is honesty that they should be showing. Obviously, we're still uh, sinners by nature that God has saved, but we should see, you should see not these consistent patterns of sin, especially in a leader who's held to a high standard. So two different things in this video, and I could probably do a longer video on his lies in general, but these are a few that I found particularly compelling. So firstly, the man from Windsor. So for this part, I have several different resources again, Firstly, we have this video here, um, Was William Branham Honest? Part 1 from Believe the Sign, and it talks about um, some of his honesty. And then in Part 2, um, there is this video, um, which actually talks specifically about the man from Windsor. So there's this video, obviously, which I'm showing you here, but there's also this article that goes into it more in depth. The way that the story starts is that the man from Windsor, there's a man from Windsor who has a false prayer card and he's trying to basically humiliate Branham and prove that Branham really doesn't have a spirit of discernment um, and that it's, um, he's trying to basically call um, Branham's bluff about him being able to discern what diseases people have because he has a false thing on his prayer card and he's actually fine. So that's the way that the story starts. Um, but then he tells it many different ways. And as you can see here, um, I really like this article because it shows you a basic, here is um, kind of what was happening when he said it. So these are, I believe, in order from when the first time he told the story, then going down to the last time he told the story. And each time it ends a little differently. So... The first time he tells the story, the man, uh, well, in all the versions, Branham is able to see through his deception, this man's deception. And um, in the first account, he, the man from Windsor, asks for forgiveness. And Branham says, there is forgiveness for you. And which is, is great, talking about forgiveness and um, showing this man grace who was trying to deceive him. But then he tells the story many other different ways in which, one, the disease that you put your prayer card will be on you the rest of your life. Then the next time, now the things on your prayer card is on you. You have it now. Far as I know, the man's in eternity today dead. So those accounts seem similar to each other. And then the next account, and the man's laying bed fast to this day. You could say that these three are possibly a similar story. Um, but then it's what would you, what you put on your prayer card you have. And screaming, he ran from the building. I don't know whatever happened. You see how he um, seemed to know what happened here. And then he didn't know here. And again, the thing that you put on the prayer card, it's on you now. The man died about a year later. So... You can see that 
these, from the first time he told the story, it's been many years. And now he's saying that he knows that the man died about a year later. Then the next time he said that he had cancer and TB and the last he heard of him um, was just a letter from them that he was in serious condition or something. So you see how it changes over time and it goes back and forth about him dying six months later. He, they took him out paralyzed. That's very different from running out screaming. So those are a few different things on the man from Windsor that I think are very important to point out. The last thing that I have for this section of honesty is the fact that he lied about his birth year. One being March 10, 1907, next April 8th, 1908, and then April 6th, 1909. And there are different documents, legal documents, that um, have been dug up and that have, are now in archives where you can see marriage certificates, birth certificates, and you can see what are what's listed. And even those things that are listed are inconsistent. And that's something that I think is quite alarming, especially seeing as the 1909 date that he gives, he gives it because he thinks it's more of a spiritual number. And um, he claims that it has it has some, um, some significance in the world of astrology. So we're not even talking about a biblical reason for why he thinks that date is, is uh, significant. He has these other reasons for why he thinks it's significant. So it seems like he changed his birth year to gain spiritual rapport. Again, those things will be in the link in the description. Now, um, thirdly, his healings. These are things that people have claimed vindicate William Branham as a prophet of God um, because of these signs and wonders that he performed. Um, firstly, we talked about this in part two, but do share scripture with them. It is not um, it does not vindicate somebody as a prophet of God or as a holy man um, or vindicate their words just because even if they did perform miracles, because Jesus said that people will be doing those things. And then when they get to heaven, he'll say, I didn't know you. And so be really careful about seeing signs and wonders as something that vindicates somebody or vindicates their words as truth, because that is not biblical, actually. And um, so that's something I think is important. That being said, um, there are a lot of cases where William Branham faked healings or um, said he healed somebody, but that person was not actually healed and still had the disease. Um, but he said that they were healed in that moment and they weren't. So um, a few examples I have for you will be linked in the description. We have um, some examples from John Collins. I highly recommend his YouTube channel. Donnie Morton and Howard Branham were some examples of healings that happened um, and they weren't actually healed. And so I will include the links to those and there are plenty more examples from John Collins um, and others that have actually done the research and looked at newspaper articles, looked at the archives to see, was this healing legit or not? Maybe some actually happened. I'm not going to totally discredit that. I think it's been so much time. It's hard to find proof so far from the time that these things supposedly happened. I don't think that they actually happened because of so much evidence of them not happening, like these specific cases not happening. So I think I'm not, I'm very skeptical, skeptical about his healings having actually taken place. But the thing is, again, even if he actually did perform some healings, miraculous healings, this would not prove him to be a prophet of God. Um, and it's clear that he was dishonest about at least some of his healings. Lastly, we're on the home stretch here. Lastly, I've got the section of doctrine. There are many issues with Branham's doctrine that are not biblical. And this goes back to the point of where it is your standard of truth. If Branham contradicts the Bible, are you going to believe Branham or are you going to believe the Bible? Proverbs 35 to 6 says, 
Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So um, I actually wondered about this as a child. Um, things where Branham would find a revelation in the Bible that nobody else could see, but he knew about it. I wondered about that because I thought, like, isn't that kind of adding to the Bible, though? Um, and I think somebody had said to me, oh, no, but he's just... Um, He's just reading in between the lines. It's not adding to it. It's there. We just don't see it. <laughs> and that logic it doesn't really line up. But yeah, that is interesting for me, something that I noticed as a child, but just kind of put on the shelf, as it were. After reading Proverbs 35 to 6, um, I think that's a good place to start. Um, and then ask about certain doctrines. So for instance, one that I find to be alarming is the serpent seed doctrine. So basically, if you haven't heard about the serpent seed doctrine, um, I'm trying to keep my channel more like PG, so I won't go fully into it. But essentially, instead of fruit in the Garden of Eden, it was actually, um, how do I put this? Instead of fruit in the Garden of Eden, it was Eve sinning with the serpent and having Cain through that sin. And so um, clearly not what the Bible says. The Bible talks about her eating the fruit and then giving to her husband to eat also. And so that doctrine is not in Genesis. And yet that is something that Branham says happened. So does he get a pass? I think that's something that you should ask the person. Why is this okay that he said this? and taught that it's scripture when it's not. Why would Branham feel the need to have this hidden doctrine? Um, besides, I think, gaining him some rapport, like all these added biblical things, people, people have itching ears to hear something that's like secret, something that new that they can learn. But this doctrine is actually, wasn't even a new doctrine. This serpent seed doctrine was something that was actually used particularly in the KKK, as supposedly biblical justification for the racial prejudice um, and abuse. Um, and this is something that Branham would have known about because Roy E. Davis, a member of the KKK, was Branham's first pastor. And it's not a stretch to think that that is where he may have learned this doctrine for the first time because it was so prevalent. This is a very racially charged doctrine, and for him to use that, not even, it's first off, it's not even his original idea. It's not like God gave him a vision of this particular idea. This was something that was used to justify things that the KKK was doing, and Branham was also promoting this doctrine as something that was biblical. I have some links in the description for you to look further into that particular doctrine. And that's just one of them. I think that there are also issues with his doctrine of the Trinity and some doctrines of like basically the personhood of Jesus and who he was, things that are not biblical, things that he added to scripture. But those are things that we won't go into in this video. I just want to give you some baseline, some knowledge of how to share these things with the message believer. The message teaches a gospel that is not true to scripture. And I am here to say that Jesus is better. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one of grace. And I think that that is something that if you are a believer sharing these things with a message believer, you should really remember that. Remember the reasons why you're sharing these things with somebody. Don't get prideful about it. Um, don't make it a competition of trying to prove them right, but do it in grace out of love for them. If you enjoyed this video, I would love it if you gave it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, of course, you know, give it a thumbs down. <laughs> um, and I ho would hope that if you have thoughts, you can feel free to leave a comment. If you want to correct any of the things I've said, Hey, be my guest. Leave me a line in the comments. With that, thank you so much for joining and I will see you next time.